Right, so this lesson is going to be uh, a broad overview of what we covered in Unit 1, um, specifically limits and continuity. Uh, so what I'm going to do is we're going to go through a few notes, uh, just basically overviewing what we covered in Unit 1, and then we're going to go through a couple practice problem sets involving limits, and then um, one problem set involving continuity. So let's start by remembering back from Unit 1 some of the basic properties of limits. Okay, so basic properties of limits, there's, there's five of them that I want to talk about. Uh, and so let's go through these relatively quickly. So the first one says that the limit as x approaches some number a of a constant k is equal to the value of that constant. Is constant. Okay. In other words, the limit uh, as x approaches a number of a number is just going to be the value of that number. Okay. Second property is that the limit as x approaches a of the sum or the difference of two functions is equal to the limit as x approaches a of the first function, sum or difference of the limit as x approaches a of the second function. Okay. The third property says that the limit as x approaches a of the product of two functions is equal to the limit as x approaches a of the first function, we'll call it f of x, times the limit as x approaches a of the second function. Okay. And then very similarly, the limit as x approaches a of the difference of two functions or the ratio of two functions is equal to the limit as x approaches a of the top function f of x over the limit as x approaches a of the bottom function, uh, provided that the limit as x approaches a of g of x is not equal to zero. Okay, but the, the main property that we're going to focus on today, uh, the, the one that we're going to use probably the most, is that the limit as x approaches a uh, of a function we'll call p of x. In order to evaluate these limits, all we're going to do here uh, is take that value and we plug that value into the function, uh, provided that p is continuous at x equals a. Okay. So when we're evaluating the limit of a function, uh, really what we're doing is we're just taking the value that x is approaching and we plug it into uh, the function of interest. Okay, it will get it will often be a little bit more trickier than that um, because the functions are not always continuous. And so what we're going to see for a lot of the example today's situations how you, how you deal with that. Okay, uh, before we do that, let's just talk about continuity. Um, and let's address the conditions of continuity. Okay, these are the conditions that must be met uh, for a function to be continuous. Uh, so let's let f of x be a function. Okay, so let's say we have a coordinate plane here, and let's say we have a function going through the coordinate plane, we'll call it this f of x. Okay, we're going to say that f of x is continuous at x equals a. Okay, and we'll call this value a here. Uh, if the three following conditions are met. Okay, so if you guys remember, there were three conditions that we talked about. Uh, the first is that the value of the function at a is defined okay uh, that means that when we go to the x value a there isn't like a hole in the graph or anything here the value is just defined at a number two is that the limit 
as x approaches a of f of x exists. Okay, so in other words, the limit from the left uh, is approaching the same value as the limit from the right. So they're approaching the same y value. Uh, and then the last one, the last property kind of sums these both up. And that is just basically saying the limit as x approaches a, the value of the limit is equal to the value of the function. Okay, and I think this is the most important property out of these three. Okay, the most important condition because this kind of summarizes everything. Uh, so this is really what must be true for the, the function to be continuous. Okay, so we'll, we'll see an example at the end of this video um, that kind of deals with this last condition. So uh, let's go through some limit examples. Let me just go through two to start off. Uh, so these are two values, these are two limits we want to evaluate. And let's remember that a lot of the times the function might not be continuous at the value that x is approaching. Okay, so for example, in the first question here on the left, if I were to plug in two, I would end up with zero on the in the numerator. And if I were to plug in two into the denominator, I get one half minus one half. So that's also zero. Uh, so we get an undefined value, but that doesn't mean that the limit is undefined. Uh, what that means is we need to do a little bit of algebraic kind of manipulation in order to see if we can cancel the hole in the graph. That's basically what we're going to be doing. We're going to be canceling the hole in the graph, which will allow us to eliminate uh, or allow us to evaluate the limit. Okay, And so each of these kind of has their own trick, I guess you could say. Uh, and let's start with the first one. So when we take the limit of a complex fraction, a fraction within a fraction, uh, what I would recommend doing, there's a few different ways you can approach this, but one way to do this that reduces the amount of algebraic steps is we're going to take the product of the two denominators inside the fraction. Okay, so that would be 2x. And we're going to multiply this by 2x over 2x, which is equal to 1. And so we're going to distribute the 2x to the numerator, and then we're going to distribute the 2x to both these terms down in the denominator. Okay, and let's rewrite this. So we end up with 2x times x minus 2 over 2x over x minus 2x, 2x over 2. Okay, so it gets distributed to the numerator, and then it gets distributed to both numerators in the denominator. Okay. All right, now let's simplify this. So notice here in the denominator, uh, when we distribute, the x's here will cancel, and the 2's will cancel, and we have the limit as x approaches 2 of 2x times x minus 2 over 2 minus x. Okay. So the idea here is um, we want, if we were to plug in 2, we would still get 0 over 0, so it doesn't quite work yet. Uh, but what we can do here is in the denominator, if we factor out a negative 1 and we rewrite the denominator as x, or sorry, minus x minus 2. Okay, so notice what we did, what I did was I factored out a negative 1, and you can actually, that will change the order of the, uh, of the difference in the denominator. And what will, what will happen now is these will cancel out, and we're left with that's really where the hole in the graph is located, is that x equals 2. We're left with the limit as x approaches 2 of negative 2x. And so now we're at a point where we can just literally plug in 2. And so the answer for this first one is negative 4. Okay. So what happens when you have like a different scenario? Let's say we have something with a radical. Okay, so that's a complex fraction over here. Uh, we also saw situations with radicals. So we, here we have a radical function. In order to evaluate this, the first thing you should always do is see if you can just plug in x. If we plug in x, we get 4 minus 4 in the numerator, 2 minus 2 in the denominator, so it doesn't work. So the trick is, um, if you don't use L'Hopital's, the trick to simplify this algebraically is to multiply this by the conjugate. Uh, and the conjugate is going to be the expression inside the denominator in this case. 
It's going to be the expression wherever the square root is or the radical is. But all we're going to do is change the minus here to a plus. So we're going to multiply this by this expression here in red. Okay, and we're going to distribute this to the numerator and the denominator. Okay. So in the numerator, let's just keep it unfactored like this. We'll just leave it. And then in the denominator, uh, what will happen is we can FOIL this. And if you guys remember from earlier in the year, this will actually just simplify to x minus 4, okay, if you FOIL this out, which is nice because now this will cancel and we have the limit as x approaches 4 of the square root of x plus 2, okay. That is something we can just evaluate by plugging in what x is approaching. And so we get the square root of 4, which is 2 plus 2. The answer is 4. Okay. So two different limits, uh, two different kind of ways we have to approach evaluating them because the functions are not defined at the value that x is approaching. Okay. And you're going to see that a lot when we have these limit questions. Let's do a practice problem set. Let's go through the following three. Okay. So the first one, um, again, let's just see if we can plug in uh, the value that x is approaching. Okay. Notice for this one, uh, we get 0 minus 25. So if we evaluate this limit, what we should always do is let's just plug in the value that x is approaching. And if you look, notice in the numerator, if we plug in 0, we get minus 25. And in the denominator, we get minus 5. So this is an example where we can actually just plug in what x is approaching, and that's going to be our answer. So we get 5 here. Okay, not too bad. Number 2. Well, this one's going to be a little bit different. Uh, and the reason why this one is different is because the limit is approaching infinity. Okay, and so the, the kind of the method we're going to be using to evaluate this is going to be a little bit different. When we have the limit as x approaches infinity, that is asking us for the horizontal asymptote of this function. Okay. So this is the same thing as asking what's the horizontal asymptote. Okay. When we to find the horizontal asymptote, what we're going to do is look at the highest degree in the numerator and look at the highest degree term in the denominator. And this is going to indicate what the horizontal asymptote is. Uh, so from the beginning of the year, we had this acronym that tells us how to evaluate a horizontal asymptote. And that is if the highest degree numerator is bigger on the bottom, it is 0. That's not the situation here. If the highest degree is bigger on the top, there is no horizontal asymptote, so it would be either positive or negative infinity. If the exponents are the same, we divide coefficients. That's the third scenario. And that's actually what we're going to be dealing with here. So because the highest degree exponents are the same in the numerator and the denominator, they're both three, we're going to divide the coefficients. And so the answer for this question is negative 3 over 2. Okay. Again, doesn't require too much math. It's just kind of recognizing how to evaluate an infinite limit. All right, so let's do the last one. This one, again, it's going to be uh, relatively easy because all we're doing here, nothing actually cancels out. So when we plug in 3, we don't get a 0 in the numerator, and we don't get a 0 in the denominator. 
And so all we're going to do here is take this value here, and we're going to plug in 3 for x. So we end up with the square root of 9 plus 7, which is square root of 16, minus 3 over 6. So we end up with 4 minus 3 over 6, which is 1, 6. That's the answer. Okay. So not all of the time we're going to need to use those methods that will simplify uh, the expression. Sometimes you, it, it's, you can just plug in the value that x is approaching. All right, problem set one. These ones are going to be a little bit challenging, more challenging, because notice for the first one, if we were to take the value that x is approaching, 0 and plug it in, we get 1 third minus 1 third, which is 0 in the numerator, over 0 in the denominator. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go through this first one. And let's remember that the, kind of the trick here is to multiply... the numerator by the product of the two smaller denominators, okay? So in other words, 3x times, 3 plus x times 3 minus x is the product of the two denominators, and we're going to multiply this expression here in red by the entire function, okay? So what will happen is this expression will distribute to both of these terms here, and then this one down here will, uh, will just be multiplied to the x. So we end up with, it's going to get a little messy, but it will simplify. So that the limit as x approaches 0 of 3 plus x times 3 minus x divided by 3 plus x minus 3 plus x times 3 3 minus x divided by 3 minus x all over x times 3 plus x times 3 minus x. Okay, so it looks like an absolute mess, but what's nice about this, this trick is that what's going to happen here is in the numerator, these will cancel and these will also cancel. Okay, so the limit as x approaches 0 of 3 minus x minus 3 in parentheses plus x all over x times 3 plus x, 3 minus x. Okay, and let's simplify the numerator uh, and see if we can get to a point where when we plug in x equals 0, um, we won't get that indeterminate form 0 over 0. So the limit as x approaches 0 of 3 minus x minus 3 minus x over x times 3 plus x, 3 minus x. Well, what happens in the numerator is these 3s will cancel. The x's don't cancel, though. We have the limit as x approaches 0 of negative 2x over x times 3 plus x, 3 minus x. So notice if we plug in 0 um, in the numerator, we get 0. If we plug it in the denominator, we still get 0. However, these x's will now cancel. And so the limit as x approaches 0 uh, of negative 2 over 3 plus x times 3 minus x. Okay, now we're in a position where we can actually just take the value that x is equal to. We've canceled out the hole in the graph, um, and we can just plug in uh, that value, x equals 0. So we end up with negative 2 over 3 times 3, which is 9. Okay, so that's the answer for that one. The second one's going to be much easier. Uh, so question number 2 from the top is the limit as x approaches infinity, x plus 5 over 2x squared plus 1. 
So this is a situation where the value of x is approaching plus or minus infinity. So all it's asking, again, is what is the horizontal asymptote? What's the horizontal asymptote? To evaluate the horizontal asymptote, we're going to use that acronym. Uh, and this time, we're going to use the first scenario because the highest degree exponent is bigger on the bottom, and so the value of the uh, the value of the horizontal asymptote, therefore the value of the limit, is equal to zero. That's the answer. Okay. So because the value of the horizontal asymptote is zero, the value as x approaches infinity, as x tends really far to the right, the function is going to tend to infinity. Okay, and let's wrap this up by going through uh, a problem set involving the conditions of continuity. Okay, so here we have a here we have a graph that uh, has so it's sort of like a piecewise function graph. There are a bunch of uh, breaks in it. There are points of discontinuity, we'll call them. Um, and the idea behind this problem is we want to identify uh, the location of the points of discontinuity, where the what x values is the function discontinuous. And then we're going to use the three conditions of continuity to justify why uh, the, uh, the function's discontinuous at those points. Okay, So let's just remember that uh, kind of one way to think about continuity is a function is discontinuous if I draw it using my pencil and I have to lift up my pencil at any point. Okay, so there are three points where I have to lift up my pencil drawing this. And so there are three points of discontinuity. But we want to be a little bit more rigorous in how we define discontinuity here. Okay, and we're going to use the conditions of continuity to do that. Let's start with the first point of discontinuity. That's going to be right here. It's a jump discontinuity. And it is discontinuous, it looks like, at the x value, x equals negative 1. Okay, so we're going to start there. Why is it discontinuous? Okay, let's go through those three conditions of continuity. Well, remember, if one of them fails, then we're done. Okay, so uh, the function is h of x. So let's start by determining whether or not h of negative 1 exists. So does the value of the function exist at negative 1? Yes, it is equal to 4. Okay. Does the limit as x approach as x approaches negative one of h of x does that exist? Well, in order for the limit to exist, the limit from the left has to be equal to the limit from the right. So, does the limit? as x approaches negative 1 from the left of h of x equal the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right of h of x. Is this statement true? Let's find out. So the, the value that the function is approaching as x approaches negative 1 from the left is going to be the y value that the function approaches over here. So notice as we approach negative 1 from the left, the y value of the function is approaching 4. Okay. So this limit over here is equal to 4. The value of the limit as x approaches negative 1 from the right is going to be the y value of the function as x approaches 1 from the right. And that's going to be, uh, it looks like about, let's say, 1 half. Okay, so as we approach negative 1 from the right, the y value, or the height of the function, is approaching a value of about 1 half. So, does 4 equal 1 half? No. So, the limit from the left does not equal to the limit from the right. Therefore, the limit does not exist. Therefore, it is not continuous. Okay, so that's why x equals negative 1 is not continuous. So it's one thing to just look at this and identify, oh, there's a jump discontinuity. 
it's not continuous. It's another thing, and this is where I want you guys to get, this is why, where I want you guys to justify uh, your answers, is saying, oh, it's discontinuous because the limit from the left is not equal to the limit from the right. Therefore, the limit doesn't exist. Okay. Uh, all right, next one. Well, the next point of discontinuity is going to be here um, at this asymptote because I have to lift up my pencil to draw that. Okay, but let's justify it using the conditions of continuity. Um, so let's start with recognizing that the x value itself. Okay. So the x value, um, so let's see if the function is defined at 4. Um, h of 4 is not defined because there's an asymptote. I'll say is undefined. H of 4 is undefined. Okay, so because H of 4 is undefined, the first condition of continuity is violated, therefore the function is not continuous. And you can actually just stop right there. That's all you need to do. Uh, you could also say that the limit from the left is not equal to the limit from the right. Um, but using the conditions of continuity, once one of them is violated, the, the rest uh, don't really matter. So as long as you recognize uh, the function is not defined, uh, therefore it's not continuous, that's fine. All right, last one. Uh, the last point of discontinuity. So here's one point. x equals negative 1. x equals 4. Uh, the last point is going to be over here at x equals 6. Okay. So let's go through the conditions of continuity. I'll do it over here on the right. Um, so x equals 6. So is the function defined? Is h of 6 defined? Uh, yes. h of 6, the value of the function at 6 is negative 2. Right here. Does the limit exist? Does the limit as x approaches 6 of h of x exist? Well, in order for the limit to exist, the limit from the left has to be equal to the limit from the right. So the limit from the left is going to be the y value. As we approach 6 from the left, that's going to be equal to 2. And then the limit from the right is going to be the y value as we approach 6 from the right. And that's going to be also equal to 2. So the value of the limit is equal to 2. Okay, so the first two conditions of continuity are satisfied, so now we have to go to the third condition. Uh, and so the question is, the, does the value of the limit as x, approach, as x approaches 6 equal the value of the function? Is this statement true? Uh, in other words, is the second condition equal to the first condition? Uh, and the answer in this case is no, because uh, 2 is not equal to negative 2. So the, uh, so the third condition of continuity is violated, therefore the function is not continuous at x equals 6.